Hello, my name is Dennis Daly and I'm an interviewer for the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County. And today we have the great honor and privilege of talking with Mr. Lawrence Radel on December 29th, 2008. Almost done with 2008 here, just a couple more days. Uh, and our camera operator today is Yvonne Franklin. Mr. Radel, again, thank you for agreeing to do the interview for us. And I thought uh, we usually like to start off with uh, just a little bit of background. Where were you born, sir, and where did you grow up? I was born at the Bacon State, Cincinnati, and I grew up up in St. Bernard, and, and I graduated from high school in 1941. Now, during high school, did you have any uh, particular interest, hobbies? Were you involved with sports, or? Yeah, all sports. I mean, and I decided because you had to get a B or better to play in sports, so I made sure I got a B so we could <laughs> play in the sports. Any favorite sport? Baseball? Or? Well, I like the whole lot. Okay. Uh, and you said St. Bernard High School? Yeah. And you graduated in 19. June of 1941? Yes. And so uh, after that, what happened? You said you got involved with the uh, painters uh, union? Yeah, I was a, went in the union as a apprentice painter and paper hanger. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, now, at that time, the Depression was still winding down. Yeah. Did you have any problems finding work when you got out of high no, school? No, because or? my grandpa was an organizer of the union. Okay. And uh, he got me to be a prince as a painter and paper hanger. So you, you worked through the summer and the fall and then uh, of course uh, everybody from that generation remembers where they were on December 7th, 1941. Where, where were you when you heard the news about the bombing of Pearl Harbor? Well, I was at, at uh, on Court Street in, in Cincinnati. Uh, clean paint brushes. Okay. And it kind of made me mad. And uh, all of us were mad. Sure. And, uh, and then I thought about joining the Marine Corps. Okay. And uh, tell us about how you got into the Marine Corps. Well, I enlisted in the Marine Corps April of 27, 42, with, uh, with a fellow who lived upstairs from me. And we both joined in, in uh, April of 27. And then from there we went to Paris Island, of South Carolina, to uh, boot camp. Now, uh, tell me a little bit about uh, a little bit about traveling into the south. Had you been, had you been into the south before this, or no? We went out from the Union Terminal, and that was a, when we went down on the train down the Union Terminal to uh, Paris Island, okay, South Carolina. No, that's the first time I ever went out of there. The, the train from the Union Terminal. Okay, that was probably a really busy place in in, yeah, in the spring of '42. So you got to uh, you got to uh, Paris Island for boot camp, mm -hmm. uh, and you're 20 years old at this point. Mm -hmm. And had you ever been out away from home at at all before this? Well, or? I used to go with my grandpa when I was young. He used to travel all over the country, uh, inspecting different unions, and he would, we would I would meet him on the train. And, where, I, where he was, and, and then he'd take me around the cities, different cities, where he was. And I got to travel when I was young. Okay. So it wasn't as big of a shock for you to be, no, to be oh, away? No, no, I, I knew all about dreams from <laughs> little on. Uh, and so then you got to boot camp. What was boot camp like? I never dreamt it would be like that. I was never treated like that in my life. Never. All my dreams, I never thought anybody would yell and scream. Why like my mother? She would about died if she knew how it was treating us. And I guess it, it made a man out because after that, nothing was too hard for me. Sure. Nothing. Nothing. And, and this was uh, the summer, so it was pretty hot down there. I'm sure. Oh, it was terrible. A lot, of, a lot of marching and uh, swamps and and the training was just can't believe how they trained us. Why the the first day when we got there, they started screaming and hollering at us. We uh, double timed to where we was going to live, our barracks, and from there we went to the supply building to get our clothes and that, and we'd get one item at a time and go back to our locker, put it in our locker, and then go back and get another piece. We just did this until we got all our supplies and clothing, and we double timed from the time we got there until the time we got all our supplies. And that and, they, and that's how they made you do it. That's how made us. Oh, why well, sure you? And you didn't think you had to do it. Whatever they said, you did. You yes or no, sir. Them 
from the time you got there until the time you left. And they trained you in the use of a number of different weapons, I'm assuming. Yeah, they did. And we had a old Southern GI, and I have to tell you what he said when we got off the train. He said, you, you might mean the world and all your mother, but you're just a pain he ass to me. <laughs> and I'll never forget that. And we wanted to please him. And another thing he did to us, he put a, a bucket of, a gallon bucket of, on one end of the floor and a bucket on the other. And he said, I'd like a few cigarettes in there. We had them overflowing. We didn't want to get them so he made them out. <laughs> and we trained the bayonet train hand to hand. And uh, we marched with 70 pound pack. And I mean to say it was something, it was hard. And how long, how long were you in we basic We did that training? for eight weeks. Eight weeks, and okay. Then four weeks, we went to, to uh, rifle training. Okay, so you spent four whole weeks dedicated to, to rifle training. Four weeks in rifle training. Wow. Yes. Was that also in Paris Island? Yeah, that was at Paris Island. I, and you had to qualify in the Marine Corps or you was out. Okay. And I never even shot a BB gun before because my dad saw a person get his eye put out when he was a kid. He wouldn't let us shoot anything. Well, I was scared to death. I practiced all the time. Here I ended up first with a pistol in our platoon, expert, and then a second high with a rifle, a sharpshooter, and I never fired anything before. Oh, wow. I wanted, didn't want them guys mad at me. Sure. <laughs> so I practiced every chance I could get. So when you got done with rifle training, is that when you were officially a Marine, or were you a Marine yeah, that, after eight weeks? Yeah, that was after we was done with that, then we graduated from the Marine Corps and went to Camp Lejeune, so, uh, North Carolina. Okay. New River Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. What'd you do there? Then we formed the 3rd Marine Division there. Okay. And uh, on my company, it was I Company, and our captain was a famous writer. He was Captain Munt, and he wrote a book with Brother Rat, and they made a stage play of it on Broadway. Okay. And later on, when we was on Bougainville, he wrote a book about the Bougainville, and it was called Brother Rat. You know, it, and the, it, sure. was a, it was a ribbon and a star. The book was named A Ribbon and a Star. And everyone that was in the original outfit, he sent us a book. Oh, really? And I'm on the cover of the book. Oh, wow, okay. So uh, you formed the, the Third Marine Division in uh, Lejeune. Yeah, Camp Lejeune. And then did you get orders to ship out from there? Yeah. Okay. After we was formed our company, that, then we took a troop train to uh, San Diego. How long did that take? Do you Camp remember? Camp I imagine that took about seven, eight days to okay. get across country. And, uh, and then you were in uh, San Diego. Yeah. Uh, and then from there you from went there, overseas? We shipped out on, the, on a cruise ship to uh, uh, American Samoa. Did you have any idea where you were going when you shipped out? Or? No. Okay. No, they only told us. Sure. I have a car that uh, but my mother kept everything. Whatever I did, she kept. And I have a car that tells me when we shipped out and everything. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, did you travel in convoy or were you in a single no, ship? it was just in a... And zigzagged, I'm, I'm assuming? Yeah. So, so you wouldn't have to worry about the Japanese? Yeah. yeah. Now, did you go directly to American Samoa from yeah, California? Yeah, directly to okay. American Samoa. <clears throat> and what, what was that like when you landed there? Was well, that... On, on American Samoa, they had the world's most cheapest match of love. was Pago Pago. We landed it. And the ships could pull right up the shore. And we stayed there for nine months. And the natives thought we was crazy the way we trained there. Because, and they thought it was so hot and everything. And they thought, what's the matter with them? Marines are they goofy? Because they would relax all the time. They would do that. So th this training probably was more specific to what you were going to be doing. So were you doing like uh, beach landings and well, and that kind of stuff, or what? What kind no, of training did you do? It was actually just regular training because Guadalcanal wasn't hit yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Guadalcanal was the first island they hit. So. So you were basically doing the same thing that you had done in basic training. Same exactly. Okay. The same thing. For nine months. For nine months. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I went into a 60 millimeter mortar squad. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
And later on, I became a squad leader of 60 millimeter mortars. So, so what did you, that's interesting. Tell, tell us about what your job was in the mortar squad. Well, I was a squad leader, and, uh, and uh, I had to get my men to, you know, the, be sufficient and, uh, and setting up that tube and getting the, getting the place clear so I could set up a base stake to uh, an enhancement is fire where we're going to hit because we gave the support to the rifle squad and the marine gun squad. That was my main objective. I could set that thing up in, in about <laughs> nine seconds with the sights and everything on it. Okay. Mm -hmm. How many how many men were in a were in a mortar squad? Mine, twelve. Twelve men. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how many how many mortar tubes were in that squad? How many mortars did we Yeah, each how many mortars? One, uh, well, the guys that carried the mortar, they had a thing that went over them beside their bass pad, and they had to carry these in, in, the, in front of them and in the back of them, the guys that carried all them mortar shells. Okay. And they got, that was a hard job. Sure. Beside your pack, them poor guys carried that. Ca the base, carried all the shells? the base plate and the tube that the mortars went into. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there were actually, in your squad, there was more than one mortar tube that, that you guys fired at one time. Well, I, I, I was the one that set it up with, with the sights and everything. Okay. And then, then there would be a guy that dropped in the, in, the, in the shells into the tube. So on Samoa, you got into the mortar squad there, yeah. correct? So you trained with how to set that up yeah. and, mm -hmm. and firing it. Now, in, in a Marine... Uh, advance or, or, or what have you, were you in the front of, of the rest of the Marines or where, where would the mortars be or would you be behind the front? It was just a short way back. There isn't hardly any front. Right, okay. We were just a little ways back. Just a little bit behind the, behind yeah, the infantry? Not very much. Mm -hmm. So uh, after your nine months then, what happened? Did you, did you board a ship? To no, then we went to Guadalcanal. Then you went to Guadalcanal, but that had already the battle had already been ta had taken yeah, place we there. Yeah, on patrol. Okay. And uh, patrolled all the whole island. And uh, on, on, on Guadalcanal, they had, uh, I have to tell you this, they had coconut trees from Palmolive had them. And then trees were just like corn, like you put corn stalks up in a, in a farm. Every one of them trees had shrapnel in them. From, really? From mortar shells and bombs sure. and everything. Every one of them. Wow. Them. So everyone that on the shoreline, or just everyone on the entire island that you saw? All of them. Wow. Everyone. As did far as your eye could, you could see, it was coconut trees. When you, when you did patrols, you were doing foot patrols? Yeah, also. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, did you ever encounter any Japanese when you Never were there? On, no, but we had the Japs bombed us some day and some night. Okay. And we had one they called the Pistol Charlie, where he would come over. He dropped the bombs in the bay, and we never dropped them on us. And we could never understand that, and that's why we called him that. <laughs> I bet you were happy that he was oh, dropping them in the yes, bay. <laughs> we were really happy about that guy. So um, from, then from Guadalcanal, what, what happened next? From Guadalcanal, we went to New Zealand. Okay. And from New Zealand, we stayed there seven weeks, and that was the best time that we ever had. We had restaurants, movies, streetcars, everything. And but we still trained, but we had all this fun do afterwards. And we had to be out of the town by 11 o'clock at night, there was a curfew. Okay. But we had a good time, and, and the people treated us like kings there. <laughs> I mean, and they called the streetcars trams and uh, stuff like that, but they were really wonderful too. What kind of other... Uh, and we trained there the same as we would any other place. Okay. So there, so there was a jungle area outside of the city? Oh, yeah. We was outside the city. Of, and we had to take a train back to our area where we trained. Did you, did you run across in New Zealand any uh, other countries' military, like the English, British Army, or anything like that? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then New Zealanders, they was all... Away fighting. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. Now, just to backtrack a little bit, uh, when when you were talking about uh, your R and R in New Zealand, when you were on American Samoa, was there any kind of entertainment that that the U.S. Marines brought in for you, movies or anything like that, or 
Not at all. Mm -mm. For nine months there. The only person I ever saw was little Jack Little, a piano player. Okay. And I'll tell you on Bougainville, who came to see us, and she was wonderful. Mrs. Roosevelt. Oh, really? Came to see us, and her, and I'll never forget that. And her, I guess her secretary came with us. Oh, wow. Because her son was a captain in the Marine Corps. Sure. Now, I couldn't get over her exposing <laughs> herself to that. Absolutely. Because yeah. there wasn't no, all those front lines on Bougainville. There wasn't no. Wow. And she came. So let's get back to where we were. So you're on New Zealand, and then you, you ship out to Bougainville from there, correct? We got on, on a troop ship and maneuvered out in the ocean for about a month. And you had no idea what, what no, your objective we was or anything? Nothing, no. Okay. And then when we started the landing on Bougainville, we had to go over cargo nets. And if you said that isn't something, with your pack and your rifle and my sure. sights, and that boat going, and they're about two stories high, and that boat going up and down, and you're trying to get in and tip when it comes up, not down. So you're getting, you're getting into the uh, LCI there? or We was getting into uh, the Higgins boats. The Higgins boats, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what was that day like? Were you very, were you nervous about what was going to happen? This was your first combat experience, correct? Sure, sure you were sure. really nervous. Oh, sure, you're, you're scared to death, actually, yeah. because I was the, but I still wanted to be an action. Right. I still wanted to, to get out to Zaps for, for doing what they did. Sure, sure. Uh -huh. And that, that first landing, we was about, I guess, I don't know, about 6,000 yards from, from, from the beach. And then when we went in, it was something. You know, the bombs going over their heads and stuff like that from our ships and going towards that landing. And when we land on the Bougainville, it's all it goes over in the wall. There's only a small landing. The beach wasn't over 600 feet, I don't think. Okay. And you came the jungles and the swamps because we landed where the Japs never thought anybody would ever land. Because the, the beach wasn't very and big then? It was a green hell there. I never, I mean, it was the worst place I'd, I'd ever been in. Was there a lot of Japanese resistance where you were at? Yes. Or? Okay. And we got, there was mortars and Jap bar, and we got into them jungles as fast as we could do. And, and there, sure, there was fighting. But it, they, they came down later on that. But there was a lot of fighting to the right and left of us. And the Raiders, the Marine Raiders got a lot of it too. Okay. So then you got into you got off the beach pretty quickly. Oh yeah, we got off the beach as fast as we could, but because of the mortar shells and the firing and machine gun, and it's, you can't describe how, what it's like. And then what, if you if you if you would, uh, what was the combat like when you were when you were in the jungle? I mean, what I'm assuming there wasn't a lot of big, you know, troop movements. It was probably small, isolated. This is what I'm assuming, and I. I what was the combat like when you were when you were on Bougainville? Well, we was always looking for them mm -hmm. because we wanted to establish a, an airport and a, for the for our ship, uh, planes to come in. And uh, I don't even see how the Seabees ever did it to build a road and an airport in a hell place like that. I don't even know how they ever accomplished it, but they did. Later, when we come back, the, somebody said there's a road, and I said, "What road?" Well, we couldn't believe what they did. And it was hell. Fighting kept going it's all the time. That they, and they could camouflage themselves so good. Mm -hmm. You didn't know where they was at, snipers. I mean, you didn't know what was going to happen next. One time when we was out in front of the front lines, our company reconnoitered, they really hit us with a big force. And I think our for six to eight hours, we had nothing but surrounded by Japs fighting. No place to go. We didn't think it was ever going to stop. And I felt sorry for the corpsmen because there was no place to evacuate the wounded or to kill. I mean, the guys that were wounded thought they was going to bleed to death before anybody would ever get to them. And you just can't imagine what it was like. Now, you know? Did you finally break out of that situation? Well, or? we finally, after eight hours, 
couple outfits came to our aid. You know, and a couple of guys, that, I had one guy in my outfit, he had his knee locked on him. He was screaming, well, I ran over and pushed him down. And, and this day, I think if you could see me, he would be thanking me because, I mean, you couldn't lift your head up the way he was firing the machine guns and mortars at him. It was one hell of a <coughs> And then we finally got aid from another outfit. So you have got to evacuate the wounded and oh, yeah. get back a little I bit? I think they did. But you still try and evacuate the wounded and the ones that are killed in the jungle is almost an impossible task. Because there was no road at that point. I mean, there's hardly, and the, and the, and the poor doctors and them was right behind us. And they was jeopardizing themselves because of, of the, the Japs and the mortars and that. Now you said earlier when we were talking before, uh, you were, was, was Bougainville where you were on for 57 straight 52 days? 52 days. 52 straight days? And, then when and it rained every day, you said there? It rained every day, and when I, uh, I put a helmet in my foxhole, because the foxholes were filled up, and you didn't want to sit in water. And we had our shirts off at all the time, because of, because of the constant rain. Okay. And it was awful. For 52 days we was at. And you never got pulled off the line to rest during that time never, at all? Never. All the time we was on the front lines for 52 days straight. Mm. Now, how did you finally get R&R at, at Bougainville? What, what happened? Did you secure the island or? No, they, after 52 days they had the 37th Division of the Army come and relieve us. Okay. And then we went back to the beach. We thought, oh, we got a nice and then all at once an earthquake hit. Oh, really? <laughs> and they had an active volcano there. And we thought, oh, damn. If that damn volcano explodes, where in the hell are we going to go in this little bit of hell? Well, it wasn't little. It was a big hell. But where was we going to go? And that ground, I mean, it went back and forth. And that scared us as much as the Japs did. <laughs> so you finally got some R&R &R and, and, and an and earthquake got hit. Off and got shipped back. And it was on a Christmas day. Christmas day of 43? Mm-hmm. So, so after the after the earthquake hit, you got back out on the ships. Did you go back to New Zealand? We went back to Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal, we okay. Start training to hit other islands, and the and the. Now you had to have at least some period of rest, though. After no, after we went back. And we really? Get, no, we didn't get no rest. We kept training to hit smaller islands. We went like New Caledonia and different islands like just for the up and coming landings. Okay. Yeah. So what what was your next action then? And and I'll to tell you, we had about a third of our men left. You, you lost two was, thirds. And the rest were replacements. Wow. That's we got replacements on Guadalcanal. Now I've heard this from other GIs and, and Marines, uh, and tell me if this was your experience as well. When you got the replacements after something like Bougainville, did you find yourself not? getting very close to the replacements because you had lost uh, some friends on the island or was that something that just wasn't that wasn't the case for you well I, i'm friendly with everybody now. okay other my other guys might have said that but i knew what i went to and i was going to help them all sure absolutely everything i could absolutely <clears throat> so uh so you train you're training then uh yep. on uh, guadalcanal yep all over again and, uh, and then what, what happened next? And then from there, we got on the LST. Okay. And that was the worst ship I was ever on. It was an overgrown rowboat. It hit the water just like a small rowboat. And I thought, I'd never get off of that damn thing. And we had that LBTs that, was in the, the, that we landed on Guam with. They was in the, the bottom of the LSTs and that they could go right up on the shore. But uh, we was out on the, the MLSTs for, oh, I know, a good month. Trailer. Really? Yeah, and I never was on a ship, was nothing like that. Those are pretty small, aren't they? I mean, yeah. compared to, so, so you had to sleep on an LST for a month? Yeah. Wow. Hey, you just think. <laughs> Do you get sick a lot, or? Well, I'll tell you what happened to us. When we had to go on a landing, the fumes were so bad from them LBTs that we thought the ramp was never going down. In fact, we wanted it to go down to get out of the dumb thing. You know, sure. to start the landing. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Because the pews were just terrible. And besides thinking about making another landing, right, it was bad enough about that. But that burn pews on that LST was terrible. Now this is your second landing. Yeah. And this is on Guam, correct? I was just as nervous on the second one so as the, I was on the okay. first. Okay, so I, nothing had changed, or no, did, I was just as nervous and as scared as the first okay. as I was on the second. Um, I felt sorry for the for the replacements because I just knew what was going through their mind. Sure. Because going through through my mind on my first landing, I knew what was going through their mind. Sure, sure. But but and knowing one of my duties when uh, uh, my when we went in. I had to be the last guy on to get the guys to make sure they got off. And I had to push one guy over because he was so scared and I and, and, and really hurt me doing that. You had to push him onto the landing craft? Yeah, had to push him over and make mm -hmm. him get off. Because that guy wanted to get the hell out of there because all the hell was breaking the sure. That was terrible. The landing on Guam was the worst landing. That was worse than Bougainville? Oh my God, yes. You can't believe it. The beach was big and long and wide. They had us zeroed in. I mean zeroed in. It took us three days to get 900 yards. Oh, really? Three days. You were on the beach for three days? It took us 900. To get 900 yards, it took us three days. Wow. And all I ate was one darn candy bar from my K ration. I couldn't eat that mess. I couldn't, because all the guys get killed. Sure. You just don't feel like it. So, so what did you do on the open beach like that? Did you just dig foxholes and, and well, try to keep in? I had my, I had my squad. And I had to make sure that I knew where we was going, how to follow the, I had to follow the platoon, and I had to make sure all that happened and where I was going to go. And I'm telling you, in a time like that, it's hard to even think what to do. Sure, sure. I mean, if it wasn't for your training and that, you wouldn't have did it. Do you think your training just basically took over then and you, and you worked on instinct yeah, at that point? Yeah, that training we had helped us get through it. I know why we were on, on Paris Island, why they were so, so they had discipline and these had to have order. And then I knew why that we had to be trained like that. So you took orders without even thinking. Sure. And you went. <clears throat> so uh, you're on the beach. No, oh, at, at, at you can't believe what it was like. You can't. And did you finally get in, get nope. into some jungle area there? No, nope. nope, it wasn't like that. Okay. We got 900 yards and, and uh, we set up a perimeter for the other boats to come in at Depends so the supplies and other boats could come in. Okay. We set up at Depends. And it was something, even watching that. Sure. I mean, it's hard to explain or describe how it was. I, I, I bet you it's just almost impossible, I would, I would think. I've seen guys get tore apart. <clears throat> they had done 90 millimeter mortars and jets that it was something terrible. Pouring down on you? And a machine gun fire and a rifle fire. And, you know, what the hell was going to do? Now, did you get a chance to use your mortars when you were on the beach there? Were you, were you firing your mortars or did you? No, I actually didn't. Okay. We actually didn't get a chance. Just because of, of everything going well, on around you? Try and get, get off that darn beach and sure. get away from what was happening. It was. So what happened next? Well, we set up that perimeter for other uh, ship boats to come in. And then from there, we, after that, we moved on a, in a, a little bit. You so, know, so you got off the beach then? We must have stayed here about three or four days. Okay. And you got wounded on Guam. Mm -hmm. Now, when did, did that take place? Well, that was after a while. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then what, what, what was the combat like once you got off the beach there? Was it, was it like terrible. Bougainville? Just terrible. One day, uh, we started out and, and uh, there was an anti-tank gun up ahead. And my platoon charge and Sergeant Puller told me to set up my mortar and fire. It was about 75 yards up. He told me the asthma and the yardage. I set up that mortar and he said to me to fire. And I fired and the first shot I hit, he hollered, do you hit a direct hit, Larry? 
He said, bar for effect. So I bought, dropped three more in and knocked out the any tank gun and all the chaps around it. And uh, boy, he, he said, we well, did it, Larry, you did it. You did it, he started screaming. Because you don't have no telephone. Right, right. That, oh, sure. I hope I don't get emotional. <clears throat> Yep, and then we, uh, you know, we kept going and kept, kept going, so we could establish a place for that that uh, airfield. Okay. Because they had one there, and they made it longer. They used, they got the sea bees, got coral from the ocean, and used that just like cement for them big bombers. Oh, like really? The coral from the ocean. Wow. They put it on that landing field, and it got hard for them big. Bombers to land. So this was a Japanese field that you guys took over and then they well, made it, it they made it longer? The Americans, but the Japs took that over in forty one in December. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It took us only thirty six days to to take that out. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you one day what I did and I really gooped. One of the Japs tried to turn in and uh, surrender. And Sergeant Campisi of the machine gun outfit said, no Jap's going to surrender to me, and he shot him in the face. Oh, wow. So uh, the Japs must have witnessed that. And that night, all hell broke loose trying to get hit at him. So the, my platoon sergeant hollered to drop a flare in. So I had to get out of my foxhole, because a mortar you can't put in a foxhole and drop a flare in that foxhole. And I thought any minute somebody was going to stab me in the back or shoot me because I was so exposed. And here when I set that flare up, Sergeant Ford said, fire for effect. Well, I goofed. You're supposed to wait for it to burn out. But I dropped one right in after the other. I had the place lit up like like a like crossy field or riverfront stadium or like a night ball game. He started screaming and cussing at me. He said, well, hell, the Japs can see us better than we can see you. <laughs> but the next day, he apologized to me and uh, said that uh, I know he was just through that distress and nervousness, things like that. Sure. But I really gooped that day. <clears throat> I mean, they were really coming in on us. And I guess the reason why they didn't shoot me because I was helping them. It's a hell of a thing to say, but that's what happened. Sure. Mm -hmm. Now, that, you, we talked a little bit before the interview. Uh, what, what was it that you said the Japanese used to do at night to try to expose the foxholes? Well, and on Bougainville, they would take a bayonet with a, I mean, a bamboo pole with a, with a bayonet and try and stick it down your foxhole. And if you fired, well, they throw a grenade in. So you should so you learn not to fire your rifle. Did you ever have an instance where, where a bayonet came into your foxhole? No. Okay. I th I'll tell you another thing. We were the first ones to use dogs. Okay. In the in How, action. How'd you use dogs? I used, we used dogs in action, and they were wonderful. Did you use them to sniff out where the Japanese were? Or? Them dogs did. Okay. And they were just, but you didn't get near them because there was only two people that they obeyed. They'd bite you just the same as they would a jab. So you didn't get near them. But they were wonderful. Them dogs really helped us. Well, I never knew that they, they used dogs on the on oh, the island. It was was really, they really was good. Did you use dogs on Guam as well? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're going along and, and tell us tell us how you got wounded if you would. Well, we were we was going up going out and we got into an opening. And a machine gun opened up on us, and the new machine gun hit me across the, the nose and hit four other guys in the same area. And, uh, and I never had anything burn or felt like somebody took a hot poker and stuck you with it. I thought my flesh and my, my was burning, and it was burning so much, it was burning so much, and just blood just streamed down my face. <coughs> Well, this corpsman happened to be nearby and, and saw us. Happened to be there, and got, got good thing. 
So I got behind, and I didn't want to get hit again, so I got behind a rock or something. I don't know what it was. And he came to me, because he must have thought I was the worst. And I'll never thank, thank him, but I never did get to. I never got to thank him or see him again. But he stopped the blood from, from, from my going, stopped my bleeding. And he, uh, I don't know how he did that so fast, but he did. And then he still bandaged me up. And I said, it's still burning like hell. Well, he said, it will burn. You've been hit by a bullet. He said, you've been hit. And then he said, but it's not a major wound. You're going to be all right. And he said, and he bandaged me. He kept talking to me or he bandaged me up. And he said, just take care of your wound and keep it clean. And, and then he went to take care of them other guys. And, and that's the last I saw him. So you got hit in the nose? Mm hmm Okay. So what, what happened from then? Were you pulled off the line immediately? Well, we, we couldn't because there was all that bite going on. And we had to stay there until, the, until that biting stopped. And then they evacuated us down on the beach. And then from there we got on a, a ship. And that ship happened to be going, shipping out the same day, lucky for us. And we went to Hawaii to recuperate. Okay. And recover. So this is really the first rest you've got since you had since you had Bougainville, really. Yep. That that must have, I mean I know it was it was probably rough because you were wounded, but it must have been a little bit nice to get off the line there and and, and well, rest a little bit. I don't know. You know I, I was glad to get the hell out of there. Yeah. You want to see action, but you don't want to go back. Sure, sure. Because it's hard to describe. I know I'm not doing a job on it, but you're doing a great job on it. But I don't want to. Tell some of the stuff about some of the guys. Sure. Because that, that, that would break me up. Sure, sure. So you're back in Hawaii now. Yeah. And you're in a hospital. Recuperating. Boy, that recuperating. was nice duty. How long, were you, how long were you recuperating in Hawaii? About two months, two, two and a half months. And then from there, we got shipped back to uh, the States. I went on a converted aircraft carrier. And then Navy guys treat us guys like we were kings. So that's great. It's great. I know that some uh, some Marines have had problems with Navy guys in the past, nope. but uh, everything nope. was good on that ship. I uh, tell you, <coughs> on Guam there was twenty thousand Japs killed. We killed twenty thousand. Mm. We had fourteen hundred Marines killed and fifty six hundred wounded. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so when you were in Hawaii, did you get a chance to see much of the island? Did you get a chance to see Pearl Harbor when you were there? or? Well, yeah, we could go around. Okay. There was only three hotels when we were there. That's a lot different than today. Oh, my goodness. When I brought my <laughs> wife back 25 years later, I didn't even know what the heck what was happening. It was so commercial. Well, and I'm sure that it was just full of servicemen when you were there in 1944. In, oh, yeah. In Mm -hmm. This would have been what time in 44 when you were back there recuperating? It was about 1944. Early, early part of the year? No, it was in around close to the, uh, December. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Late 44, okay. Mm -hmm. So then you came back to the States. Where did you come in through? San Francisco? Uh, yeah. No, San Diego. San yeah. Diego, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and from there, where did you get assigned? I went back to that. Paris Island, which I thought was a hellhole. I thought the Marine Corps and everybody was against me. But it turned out to be one of the best things that ever happened to me. Now, why did you think the Marine Corps was against you? Because they were pulling you well, out because of action? I didn't want to go back to that boot camp where you train and guys <laughs> screaming and hollering at you. Well, that was a hellhole. But I bet you things were different now when you were back there. No, you could still see young poor Marines getting treated like <laughs> dogs. But they weren't treating you that way. No, no. When I went back there, uh, I had real light duty, and then I got to come home on a furlough, get married, and then when I went back, they had a beautiful staff NGO club, and I wanted to bring my wife down with me to Paris Town. So uh, I waited on tables, and the sergeant there took a liking to me, and he said, would you like to attend bar? And I said, yeah. And he said, that's all you have to do. No other training. He said, I'm going to give you $75 extra a month besides your base pay, which was $69. And 
And he said, you have no other duty. And I said, oh my God, yes. So I did that and sent for my wife. And she came down, we lived in one room in a little small kitchen. We thought it was heaven. <laughs> I'm sure. So it was like in heaven. And then we throw up. Every Monday our club was closed and every once in a while he'd throw parties and, and we had a time and he would give us food that was left over and we could take back to our, our apartment. We really lived my life and I. So this would have been uh, in the early part of 45 when you were doing this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, a couple of major things happened. Uh, then do you remember hearing about President Roosevelt passing away? Yep. You were in Paris Island when that happened? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I uh, left uh, October of 45, I was discharged okay. in Paris Island. And, and so then you, obviously you heard about the Germans surrendering, mm -hmm. uh, and then the A-bomb. How, how did you find out about the A-bomb being dropped? Was it just announced or...? Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was the feeling on, on the base when that happened and the Japanese surrendered? Do you remember? Well, we were just... We was beside ourselves. My goodness, not I have to worry about going back again or ever, because I would have never wanted to go to Japan. And did you think that's where you were headed? Did you think you were going to be back in combat? No, I didn't think it was going to ever send me back. Okay, no, okay. No. So you felt you felt pretty safe. I, I felt pretty secure, but I would feel sorry for all the other people that had to go. Sure, sure. I mean, it was. I wouldn't imagine what it been like on Japan. So the war is over, and you're still at Paris Island. You said till October, mm -hmm. uh, and then you got mustered out from there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then what happened? And I went home, and this is my first wife I'm talking about. And eight months after that, turns. She died over childbirth. Oh. Do, do you want us to pause? Uh, do you want us to pause or? Yeah. No, no. that's all right. Okay, okay. Well, but I met my second wife and we've been married for 61 years. Oh, wow, okay. I couldn't have found a better person. Mm -hmm. yeah, and you met her back here in Cincinnati? Yeah. <clears throat> she, I was from St. Bernard. And she was from Reading. Mm -hmm. I met her at one of the Eagles at the dance. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you were telling me that you uh, became a journeyman? Oh, yeah. Painter? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then finally I got my, I worked for a fella. I went to UC after that. On the GI Bill? GI Bill for five years. And I, uh, an interior decorating. And I never had to pay for it, even a lead pencil. They paid for everything. Sure, so, sure. And then the, I went to work for uh, Mr. Penn, and, and the, I started, of course, his superintendent. And when he sold out to me, then I went in business for myself. And how long were you in business? Oh, I guess about 25 years. Wow. Mm -hmm. That must have been great. Yeah, I had, I had all these customers, and I really had some wonderful people. Doing interior decorating for people, mm -hmm. that's what yeah. you did? I had some, I had the Tash and Williams and Mashburns and... Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And the, not the tractor people. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you move around the area or did you stay in St. Bernard or...? I uh, moved to uh, Reading. <clears throat> when I married my wife, we lived in Reading from Reading. I went to Springdale and to a condominium. Okay. Excuse me. And that's where you are now in Springdale? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so Jim Squire, our councilman that brought me here, uh, is a councilman there. Okay. It's the best city in the country. <laughs> uh, and you have a family? Did you yeah, raise I a family? Have two children and two grandchildren. Okay, excellent. Mm -hmm. Are they still in the area or did they move? No, uh, my. My son's out of town. My daughter lives in the out out, out at past Anderson Township. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Wonderful. I want to tell you about the policeman in the sure in Springdale. We became good buddies because I used to volunteer for a bingo to help a Maple Mall Village 
make money for uh, for some of the people that uh, lived there, and the the policemen used to come and uh, kind of guard the money because there was a lot of money involved, and uh, and we had a thirty five hundred jackpot, and they used to come and I made good friends with them. Well, uh, some of them were Marines, and, uh, and one time uh, I said to one of them, I said, uh, "Did you know what I qualified with?" And I wanted to tell him I qualified with an 03 Springdale rifle. One of them said, what, a bow and arrow? And I said, hell, I'm not that damn old. And they just kidded me. But that's what they said to me. And it broke me up. And they just about died laughing. And we was really good friends. And they, uh, you showed me they did, uh, they honored you, didn't they? They gave you a yeah a plaque? And yeah, Springdale they had, me, had a, a, a day for me, City of Springdale Day, and, and Mr. Squire uh, wrote a proclamation for me all about what I did during the war and, and uh, different things like that. Mm -hmm. And all the policemen that, that I knew came, and it really made me feel good because of all them guys coming and sure. doing that for me. Oh, I wouldn't did. have got started in this if it wasn't for Jim Squire because I never talked about the war much. And he got me started on him. He said, well, you should do that. And he's the one that got this proclamation set up in the city of Springdale Day for me. That's great. Yeah, you deserve it. I mean, you know, you did a, did a, a lot of great things for our country and, and for the world. And we've got a couple of more minutes left. Is there anything else that you can think about? Any funny stories or anything from the war or from after the war that, that come to mind? Or Well... I think the guys that are volunteering today are really the ones to be given credit. I mean, because of the way people are talking and everything about the war, mm -hmm. and they shouldn't have it and all this baloney. I give these guys a volunteer for the Marine Corps. I think they're really dedicated people to be doing that. And everyone I see, I, I really give my handshake. In fact, uh, one of the uh, fellows at church, one of his sons volunteered, and I see him at church, and I knew he just got out of the Marine Corps, and I was collecting at church. So I went up to him and said, Semper Fi. Boy, his eyes lit up, and he knew I was a Marine, because all Marines treat people, I don't know, we just treat each other different than other services. Mm -hmm. So we got to talking to him, and, and I got to talking to his father, and he was a BF mom, a veteran. Okay. And then he had an uncle with a Marine in the Kuwait, uh, Iraq War. Okay. And, uh, and that uh, jacket over there, his daddy gave me because when I went on to, uh, to see uh, the World War II memorials, the honorary flight, okay. he, he gave me that jacket so I could go up with that jacket. And I'm glad I had it because it had a hood and it was nice and it was kind of chilly that day. And, and it was really nice seeing all them World War II memorials and the Korean Memorial, Vietnam Memorial. Sure. And the Nurses Memorial. I didn't even know they had a Nurse Memorial. It was there for about two years and it was beautiful. And the World War II Memorial was, a, was just gorgeous. And it just brought back, but when I went there, it just brought it back again. Sure. So you got to do the honor flight? Yeah. That's a, that's a great program they had. Uh, it's one of the best programs I was ever on. They couldn't have been no nicer to me. I mean, and, the, and I'll tell you what happened to me on this honor flight. Shibiot gave a, sponsored it, and the safety service director was a Vietnam Marine, and he pushed me around all them different well, World War II and different memorials. And he wouldn't let me do a thing. He took the pictures and everything for me, and, and he just treated me like, a, like I was a king. But safety service, and he writes to me now, and we, we exchanged pictures of that World War II memorial. Of course, it was something for him. And all them ones that volunteer for that memorial have to pay. Well, okay. See, we didn't have to pay sure. nothing. But when I come back home, I thought, 
I'm one of one of them World War II guys to see it, so I sent some money for them to go. The ones that are oh, that's great. couldn't afford it. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that was really wonderful. And that brought back <coughs> a lot of memories, let me tell you. Sure. And the way they did it to us, when we came back from there, from the airport in Louisville, the Korean and Vietnam veterans had two front lines for them and were right in us while we went through. Oh, wow. Wasn't that nice? Yeah, that must have been really we nice. We really appreciated that. Wow. But everywhere we went, they treated us well. I'll tell you a funny story. We had a when we would go get at the airport to be inspected to, to go through the thing, we had an old uh, World War II guy, and they made us take off our belts and change and anything we had in our pockets. He had suspenders on with a with a metal thing on it. He was hard to hear him. And uh, they said, you got to take your suspenders off. Why well, he said, my pants are falling down. <laughs> he didn't want to do it, but finally he did it. <laughs> oh, it was fun. And then, and then when he was on the plane, they had his cameras, and this camera was kind of, he had a tie so he wouldn't lose it, was kind of directed at his private. And, the, and one of the hosts said, what are you going to do, take a picture of your private? <laughs> we all just roared laughing. <laughs> We thought that was a ride. <laughs> and and when I was on the plane, a person sat next to me. This was 60 years. This is the second time he was, never was in a plane. Oh, and really? After 60 years, he got, his plane went down during World War II. And that's why he was never on a plane for 60 years after that. <laughs> but he, he uh, watched him, he, he did good. And he told the nurses, he said, we sat on the bench. We didn't have no seats <laughs> like this. And he said, when we went down, we went land in the field. And all he got out of it, he said, was a broken nose. But it was interesting. Sit next to sure. him telling me it. he wasn't on the plane. But I said, well, hell, I don't blame you for not getting back on. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, Mr. Rado, I, I can't thank you enough for doing the interview. And uh, I hope I was all right. It was, it was wonderful, and I, and I can't thank you enough well, for what you, uh, what you did for our country and what you did for the world, and uh, it was an absolute pleasure meeting you well, and speaking you with you. Thank you very much. And thank you, sir. It was a pleasure doing it for you, too. Thanks.